And it started collecting raw matrix uh, regularly. In 1986, they started expanding it, the activity to other different So they started with the program of uh, uh, participating in the functional interest of the program. Uh, it was a program organized by uh, the National Research Design Commission. So TNSF was part of the uh, National Research Commission and it was uh, uh, participating in the uh, research program. We went to all districts and uh, last night the activities of Amnara and Amnara were extended and uh, TNSF has uh, specific units now. In all the things, sometimes I'm from that. And we started a planet in Puri and Kantara. Puri is another product, it's a good product. And Kantara is a very good product. These two narratives are the last 30 years. It's a very good product. And it is the first one of the topics we have to do. And we go with the next one last. So far from that, uh, we are involved in Kamala Science. Kamala Science Forum is involved in publishing a science book, conducting it already. And we also have state programs, Banaras, and even the technical kind of human science, we have within some of the other So, uh, it has been divided into multiple activities. Uh, it's in college area, in statistics, and uh, it's also a great investment to find the idea. So we find that at some point of time, we can be work in the higher things area, and we start at the proper things area. This is a pretty common lecture. Incidentally, today is the first day of the economic. We started with the economic scenario. So in the uh, era, and we have seven hundred past the day, nineteen eighty, two thousand eighteen. We started with a memorial lecture for the great event in Amna Centenary. It was a few years by huge large number of audience. We used to conduct the meetings in the Amna Centenary. It was very comfortable up to the eighteenth meeting we did there, and the last lecture in Amna Centenary. That means. The 80th meeting was the COVID 19. We got a researcher who was working on the uh, COVID uh, virus. Uh, she came from New York and she did some research on COVID virus and she gave a lecture to COVID. Uh, COVID. So, uh, then after the 80th meeting, uh, we were in Monmouth. Now, the COVID meeting, you know, we came back to our meeting. Uh, it started with a uh, uh, Nobel Prize for 2022. It was uh, it was conducted in all three meetings uh, in Nana Center by the chemistry and biology. So, this is a pretty common debate. This is going to be an interesting topic. We are going to read an interesting topic. Uh, we, are, we were discussing about the uh, Using the technology, the in the UK uh, was tools with the clean energy technology in the plastic uh, So the first lecture will be. About the possibility of writing the genetic decisions to the being a reading entity that will be delivered by Dr. Kinsuman. And later, Dr. Priya Ramadan from Cancer Institute, she has come here and she will be uh, explaining about the reforms of leukemia and other cancer diseases. And third part of this uh, event is going to be a uh, next one session that will be added by Dr. Uh, from the uh, so, with that, um, let me have a small introduction about the which has been posted in my name. Many of you are ready. Thank you. Thank 
So, Dr. Intimati Mahayan has completed a part of the training in the area of self activity and marketing. The year 25. He also earned a three year postdoc on program at PCMD. He was joining the Council Biology Laboratory at Delhi, Elvin Prasad by his show in 2008. Dr. Mahayan's research. The research field is focused on the basic and translational research efforts towards addressing the problem of the heat and brain uh, cognitive disease and um, using the different models of adult and good uh, um, potential. The team is currently exploring the applications of the renewable circular potential cells and later demo making them. Conduction various mechanism leading to the repeat and development. The team is also engaged in traffic to research development. Not able to hear you, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let me share my slides. Yeah, yes, please. Is it visible? Is it visible? Yeah, yes. Okay. Very good evening, everyone. And it's my pleasure uh, to share uh, some of our uh, understanding about uh, what gene editing is and how it can be applied for the betterment of, uh, uh, for the treatment of human diseases. So uh, I, I would have liked to join there in person and uh, to see the audience after a long time. And uh, I think I've given a similar talk uh, one year back. I was actually looking forward to be there and present this talk uh, uh, today, but unfortunately uh, I had to uh, uh, join on online this time again. Uh, but anyways, I'm um, looking forward for some fruitful uh, discussions today. So without uh, wasting any time, uh, let me thank Dr. Vijayan, uh, uh, Mr. Vijayan for uh, roping me uh, for this uh, presentation once again. And thanks, all, thanks to all the TNSF uh, committee members and organizers uh, for the today's meeting. So today we'll be looking at the possibilities of uh, correcting genetic defects uh, using genome editing methods. So um, this group might have heard about genome editing earlier, but still for those of you who are listening to it for the first time, let me first introduce what gene editing means. So when we talk about gene editing, uh, it's editing some errors in the DNA, which are either inherited or while we, the embryo has been developing or the child is being uh, formed in the womb, some errors could accumulate and these errors can lead to some uh, physiological defects and thereby organ uh, failure or some diseases. So these uh, mutations, uh, we so far we really didn't had any uh, major uh, ways of dealing with them unless uh, uh, in the recent past gene therapy and cell therapy has been explored. 
by but now with the advent of genome editing it is now possible to intervene right at the dna level and to correct these mutations so how is it uh, done it is by uh, cutting and pasting just like how in our document you have uh, errors being typed in uh, you use an er erase bar to erase or use a backspace to go and uh, remove the uh, defective part or the error part and then replace it with the correct statement it's ex it works exactly the same it's just that it works at the molecular level and you are dealing with dna and there are enzymes which does the cut cutting and pasting job so cutting is have to be specific because we have to go tell the system where to correct because where the mutation is present for which we need to know in the information about which gene is affected and exactly which locus the particular uh, error is uh, present in the genome. So, and this have to be decided uh, for the editing system to work. And then how to do the cut. Cutting is for editing, you have a scissors and a molecular scissors, which are nothing but a nucleus, which cuts the DNA. And this cut is then uh, corrected by the endogenous repair machinery, which I'll talk to you a little later. So this was uh, uh, first, uh, well, they said there are several scientists who worked on this and uh, two uh, major contributors are uh, Professor Jennifer Dorner from University of California, Berkeley and Emmanuel Charpentier from Max Planck Institute for Infectious Biology, Berlin. So they were awarded the Nobel Prize um, in 2020 for this uh, discovery. And ever since uh, the, so the, uh, the, this two group have made the CRISPR editing system very simple in such a way that it can be easily done in any molecular biology lab uh, for doing such editing and correcting uh, 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 functions. So these are the two people who have invented this. So where did it come from? It actually came from an age-old uh, bacterial system, the two archaebacteria, we call it archaebacteria. So these bacteria use this mechanism, the CRISPR uh, machinery for, uh, as, a, uh, as an adaptive defense me me mechanism against invading uh, viral uh, pathogens. So whenever a virus comes and infect a bacteria, so the viral genome enters the cell and then the first time uh, the bacteria encounters the viral pathogen. So the genome of the pathogen is chopped into smaller pieces um, uh, because the, the residual, uh, the, is, the genome uh, is copied in small pieces and then is incorporated with the genome of the bacteria. Because you, uh, we should understand that the bacteria replicates, a, uh, divides and makes more copies every 30 minutes. So within 30 minutes time window, it should have a machinery that will recognize the pathogen and kill and eliminate the pathogen quickly. So otherwise uh, the pathogen will, uh, the viral will multiply and then it will uh, damage the entire bacteria. So it keeps this as a memory. It incorporates small pieces of the past infections of the virus into its genome. And this locus is the, called the CRISPR locus. And this, when the bacteria uh, recognizes uh, or gets infected with the viral pathogen the second time, it immediately recognizes because this locus gets transcribed and then the small RNAs are produced. And this RNA will be exactly complementary to the viral genome it binds to. And when an RNA and DNA hybrid forms, the, then this gets cleared off by the enzymes called the Cas proteins, which are the, also part of the system. And thereby it immediately chops the viral pathogen into smaller pieces and then uh, disables them. So this is a mechanism which was uh, developmentally, I mean, evolutionarily conserved uh, and in many of the archaea species. And uh, the two scientists and many others who are working in the, in the CRISPR area have developed this technology in such a way that the small memory piece of DNA can be any DNA. Say in case if we are going to aim to edit the globin gene, which causes sickle cell anemia, there is a mutation in the gene. And if you want to target the, it's that region, a small piece of that region where the mutation is present can be used as a memory 
uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the the guide uh, DNA to target the system to the gene for editing purposes. So that is how the system has evolved. So it is basically a two-part system. You have an RNA component, and this RNA component has the guide. Guide is nothing but just a 20, 21 base per long region, which is exactly complement to the region where we have to target the CRISPRs to go and cut and leave and edit. Mm -hmm. So this can be engineered. And, uh, and there are other parts of the RNA which are also uh, helps in the guiding process. So now we, we have ready commercially available vectors which comes ready-made cloned all of these parts already available in the vector system. Whereas only thing that we need to introduce is to design the exact target site which is complementary to the region of interest. And once the RNA is introduced, it goes search the entire genome. You have 3 billion bases. It has to find the exact target. And then it goes base pairs. And you have an RNA um, uh, DNA hybrid that is formed. And the Cas protein comes, sits here. And this acts as a molecular scissor because it's a nuclease. It cuts the genomic DNA into two pieces and cleaves. So once the cleavage ha happens, so the CRISPR doesn't do anything. The only job the CRISPR does is to recognize the target and recruit the Cas protein and create a damage or the localized DNA break. And this break will be healed or repaired by the endogenous repair machinery. So repair process health happens in two different ways, which is called a non-homologous end joining wherein uh, the ends have to be somehow repaired and healed. You can't afford to have open-ended DNA, open um, breaks in the DNA, which can uh, destabilize the entire genome. So immediately the quick response is to just ligate the ends in the, that process. There are a few bases that can be added or deleted in the genome. So this can lead to disruption of gene structure because a single base deletion or an insertion can completely change the reading frame. We know that the codon is just three base pair codon. So if there is one base change, then the whole thing gets free frame shifted and the whole gene uh, coding machinery gets changed. And this is one mechanism that is very useful, particularly if you're aiming to delete or inactivate a particular gene. Say if there's a cancer gene, which is uh, causing uh, abnormal proliferation of the cell, we want to target the gene and inactivate it, then this machinery will be useful. But then if the purpose is, if there is a, a defective protein that is formed because of a mutation and we want to edit and correct, then this uh, mecha mechanism of repair will not be useful because all you need to do is to replace a mutant base with a normal base. So this uh, replacement doesn't work in this case. Whereas in homologous recombination, normally this happens uh, in germline cells and that are actively dividing like in uh, 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 embryos uh, during development. Here we know that we have two copies. One copy is inherited from a parent, uh, father, another from the uh, mother. So if there is a damage in one of the alleles, one copy of the genome, and the other copy can access the template and serve as uh, uh, can provide the right information. So there uh, there are homology arms that because the ends the, the entire genome is exactly almost the same co copy, and the homologous region or the identical region will serve as template, and there will be recombination that will happen. And the, uh, uh, the defective part will be copied from the uh, other allele and this can be repaired. So this doesn't normally work in most somatic cells. As I told you, uh, uh, cells that are actively dividing and stem cells and in germline cells alone, this kind of repair mechanism works. But in other somatic cells, the, this mechanism is, uh, occurs at very low efficiency. So this uh, kind of repair processes uh, really uh, require an additional intervention wherein uh, in, a, in a cultured system, cell culture system, what we do normally is we provide an externally a, no, uh, uh, a normal copy of the gene uh, in the form of a plasmid or in the form of long oligonucleotides, which is 100 or 200 base pair long, and introduce into the cell along with the CRISPR. So when the CRISPR cuts, 
So it opens up the DNA and you have the normal copy which is introduced into the cell which is already there and that will bring about recombination repair. So these are the methods that people have been use, uh, um, uh, employing CRISPRs for either knocking off genes by NHEJ mechanisms or by uh, uh, introducing the normal uh, sequence or the, uh, in, into the mutant uh, back, uh, background. Here is an example that I've been telling you. So here uh, we have, uh, uh, this is our own example wherein we have a stem cell uh, line, uh, wherein the gene, uh, RB, we are trying to uh, disrupt a gene called uh, RB1 retinoblastoma gene, which is uh, which causes a tumor in the eye. So very young children, uh, children uh, gets this tumor, and this is a tumor of retina. And retinal progenitors where, where the RB1 gene is inactivated, it proliferates abnormally and gives rise to tumor. So what we're trying to do is to understand this gene and we wanted to create a model by disrupting this gene and so that we can use it as a model to study retinoblastoma tumor. So here is an example. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the wild type gene, normal copy. There were, uh, this sequence, whereas in the edited uh, line, you can see that about 10 base pairs. I said there are a few base pairs can be added or deleted here. In this case, it's 10 base pair deletion. So 10 is not a multiple of three, therefore it will shift the frame and you create a mutant, a mutant cell line. Similar thing can be done. This is in a cell line. You can do it in an animal model. You can create mutant animals by just cutting the DNA at the target site and expecting the endogenous NHEJ repair mechanism to happen so that some random base space can get inserted or deleted and thereby disrupt the gene of interest. So this is useful, as I told you, for creating uh, knockouts in cell lines, in, uh, uh, in cancer tissues where you are aiming to uh, delete or disrupt the uh, problematic cancer gene or in case of uh, animals to create a disease model where you really want to study a human disease in an animal model system. So, but as I told you, if our aim is to uh, correct a particular mutation, uh, NHEJ uh, doesn't help and homology directed repair mechanism doesn't work in most cell types. And even in those cell types where we can make it work, the efficiency is very low. So therefore, correcting gene, uh, uh, mutations has been a bigger challenge even after CRISPR system has come in. And uh, now uh, in the past few years, uh, the, uh, the CRISPR-based uh, tool system has really expanded. There are many other uh, high fidelity editing systems and also base editing systems have come wherein the precise mutations can be replaced by the normal uh, sequence or the normal base. So we'll talk about base editors today as, uh, as the topic of uh, today's um, discussion. And uh, so these are nothing but, uh, so the CRISPRs I said, we uh, look at it as a molecular scissors where you cut the DNA, DNA and then uh, bring about whatever uh, repair happens either by adding or uh, deleting bases. Whereas base editors, you can uh, consider like a, a pencil, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a, it's an, uh, single base editing without even cutting the DNA. So this was developed by uh, a group, uh, uh, by David Liu's group at uh, Harvard University and uh, where uh, they have, you adapted the CRISPR system uh, for uh, targeting uh, these base editors to the desired site, but then uh, they inactivated the uh, nucleus protein so that it doesn't cut the DNA. They call it as a dead gas line in the sense that the nucleus domain is mutated so that it can only bind to the CRISPR and the DNA, uh, the guide and the, the DNA, but it will not cut the DNA. So using the dead CRISPRs or uh, NICAS, uh, a, a Cas9 form which can only cleave one of the strands but not the other strand, so it doesn't cause a double strand break in the DNA. So therefore, you really avoid DNA breakage, but repair can be effected uh, uh, by engineering the system. So how it works is, so here is the dead Cas9, or it's a case actually, at least only one of the strands, but not the other strand, so therefore it doesn't cut the DNA. 
you fuse it with an enzyme called deaminase. So it can be a, a adenine deaminase or can be a cytidine deaminase, wherein your, if it is a deaminase, this is an adenosine base. So this is, here is an amine group. And uh, cast, there is a, a guide that goes and binds to the DNA in desired region, and you have a particular adenine that have to be converted or edited. Okay, so the D, uh, the Cas9 protein is now fused to a deaminase. It's engineered. There's no uh, uh, such an enzyme doesn't exist in nature, but these are engineered uh, uh, enzymes wherein uh, the new uh, the nucleus, which is a Cas9, is now fused to deaminase. So the adenosine base has an amine group and this amine is now deaminated by this deaminase. So now it results in inosine. So the inosine is now when the, there is a nick that is created by the Cas9 nickase and the other set stand opposite stand and that have to be cleaved. When it is, it, it, the cleave have to be repaired when the polymerase comes and does the repair, it reads inosine as guanosine, okay? So because the structure is identical, so therefore the polymerase will read the converted editor inosine as a guanosine, and that will bring about an A to G conversion in, in case wherever there is a mutation that leads to a problem, this A can be converted to G, right? So this is cut-free DNA editing system where you're really not cutting or double strand or breaking the DNA, but both the have double strands. You're either not cutting the DNA or only cutting only one of the strands or creating a small nick, which can be repaired by the polymerase. And thereby you can bring about the A to G conversion. Similarly, we can also, so we have four bases, right? A, T, G, C. So adenine and guanine are the purines and cytosine and thiamine are the parameters. We call it as transition mutations where cytosine is converted to T or a T can be converted to C, whatever the case may be. So here in case, uh, here the Cas9 again, the nickase is now fused to cited in deaminase. Okay, so this engineered uh, protein binds to DNA as guided by the guide RNA. Guide RNA has a complementary region and the specific cytosine that need to be converted will be deaminated. So this is the cytosine uh, cytosine structures. The amine group is removed by the enzyme and it becomes uridin. And this uridin is read by the polymerase as thymidin. So basically we are employing an ad, um, a deaminase by fusing the uh, deaminase with Cas9 to create a recombinant protein, which will bind to the DNA as guided by the guide RNA. And exactly the site and the base that need to be corrected, it brings about uh, A to T or C to T conversions. So that's how the base editors work. So this, since they, this, this does not cut the DNA, you don't have the risk of random translocations or major uh, chromos um, genomic destability happening in the system. But there are other problems, like if there are within the guide, there are 20 base pair region uh, in the guide. So if there are one C, there are other multiple Cs within the guide targeting region, and uh, those cytosine, cytosine or the guanine can also be converted. That is that risk we call it as a bystander effect. So there are um, mechanisms where such bystander edits, other than the exact cytosine or the adenine that need to be converted, we really don't want the other adenines in the near vicinity to be edited. So that is where the precision system comes in. Um, there are mechanisms where this can be uh, made possible and you can achieve precise editing of exactly the same base uh, that we wish to convert. So what are the applications? So we can edit and convert inherited gene mutations uh, either in situ, like if you are directly injecting into the uh, bone marrow where you're targeting hematopoietic stem cells or in case of eye, people inject CRISPRs directly into the eye, not yet in humans, uh, but uh, in animal models, so people have shown that it can be directly injected into the eye and it can bring about um, uh, correction in the tissue itself. Or you can harvest the stem cells or you can derive patient-specific stem cells in the dish and 
identify the mutations and you can edit these mutations in the dish and then put the cells back into the patient. So we call it as ex vivo editing where editing happens in stem cells outside the body. And then after editing is confirmed, then the cells are put back into the same patient. So these are possibilities now uh, for, for CRISPR-based editing. And you also can target cancerous gene, oncogenes, uh, which are uh, uh, mutated and that uh, causes problem. You have cancer-causing mutants that can be silenced by these mechanisms. And also in some of the dominant diseases, in recessive diseases, you get disease only when both the alleles get mutated. Whereas in dominant disease, even if one of the alleles is mutated and you have another normal copy, the patient will still have a phenotype. So because we call it as uh, the, the subunit poisoning, there are uh, 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 protein products of the gene. Uh, if there is one abnormal copy, it can bind to the normal copy and inactivate its function. So in those cases, it's possible to target the mutant allele and silence just only the mutant allele and let the normal allele go ahead and do the function. So it's possible to bring about disease correction in those cases as well. So coming to, I, I, will, I would like to give you a few examples as to how uh, uh, such uh, editing uh, system has been employed for some of the eye diseases. And here is a cross section. I'll focus on some of the genes uh, diseases uh, um, that affects the retina, which is at the backside of the eye. And uh, so you have a re re several spectrum of uh, retinal dystrophies uh, caused by over 300 genes now, it's, it's old slides. So it's, uh, more than 300 genes have been implicated in retinal dy uh, dystrophies. And uh, so far, uh, there are not much of uh, uh, treatment modalities that's available. And at the uh, moment, uh, there are many trials on gene therapy and cell therapy going on, wherein in gene therapy, the idea is to put back a normal copy. If there is a mutation that causes affects the cellular function in a gene. The gene, uh, you uh, uh, clone the normal uh, gene and put it into a vector. Vector can be a viral uh, delivery system and then allow the virus to infect the target cells. In this case, it's retina and in the virus will deliver a normal copy into the cell and uh, cells will start producing the normal protein and function. But for this, you need the cells to be alive. If the cells are already dead, gene therapy is not going to be effective in those patients. Similarly, for gene editing, also uh, the cells have to be uh, alive and if the cells are already dead, in case of dystrophies, they undergo degeneration. If they are degeneration, neither gene therapy or gene editing based therapy will be useful. In those cases, the cell therapy has been used wherein a damaged cell is now replaced by a normal cell. These are possibilities that people are exploring. So here is an example of a macular dystrophy where the center of the retina is damaged and the patients will not have vision in the central vision. And in case of retinitis pigment also, you have peripheral vision is lost because a lot of rods uh, die and therefore they will have problem in um, night blindness. Uh, and then gradually progresses to uh, a blind, I mean, uh, uh, loss of vision during daytime as well. And they'll have a tunnel vision like this. And in both cases, uh, these patients, if, um, because there's no treatment unless there is a gene therapy that's available and done, uh, it is progressive and eventually over time, uh, patient will go by. Some are congenital children, uh, very born, very young, within five years, they lose their vision. And um, whereas there are gradual uh, diseases like retinitis pigmentosa, where uh, 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 patients who are middle-aged uh, start losing their visions from somewhere around 20 years and over for 20 to 30 years, they'll gradually lose their vision. So as I told you, the available uh, therapy is G therapy uh, and cell therapy. I'll not talk about cell therapy today. So gene therapy, uh, one uh, uh, successful uh, therapy that's already commercially available as a product, at least in the US and UK is Lexterna, wherein it is an AV2 uh, viral vector packed with RP65 gene. And uh, this uh, AV vector system uh, as a, a virus uh, is delivered into the subretinal space and the virus naturally will infect the retinal cells which are alive there and deliver the gene copy, which is RP65. 
So the cells that are carrying the mutations now have both the copies are mutated and affected. Now the third copy is introduced into the cell by the virus and that will start functioning and produce a normal protein and then the function is restored. So this is possible, but the biggest problem is the viral vector system delivery system is very expensive. You can see the cost that's been here. It's close to about 80 uh, lakhs uh, in, in conversion in uh, Indian rupees for one-time treatment of both the eyes, so which becomes unaffordable for most patients uh, uh, in low-income countries. And now you have uh, uh, CRISPR editing uh, therapy also coming up combined with gene therapy. So you can either, so just like how we have introduced the normal copy of the gene into the viral vector, similarly the CRISPR editing system can be incorporated into a viral vector because the, the, the thing is you, you have to have a mechanism of delivering the CRISPR into the cell, either in the dish in stem cells or directly into the eye, you need some carrier to carry the CRISPR system into the cell. So for which people are exploring a, a viral vector, which is again AV based wave viral vector, or lipid-based systems can also be engineered wherein and the CRISPR system can be packed into the lipid nanoparticles and can be delivered. So this can be very cost-effective, unlike the AV vector system, where, wherein the viral recombinant viral production itself is very expensive and can make the treatment unaffordable for most patients. So what either, either mechanisms, whether you use the lipids to deliver the CRISPR or use the virus to, de, uh, give the, uh, to deliver. Uh, so you can do it in either two ways, so either by directly injecting into the eye. So in this case, uh, you are really worried, have to have a very precise editing system. You can't have bystander effect. You can't have off-target effect. So off-target is nothing but other than the target site, elsewhere in the genome, if the CRISPR can go by chance, it can go bind and edit and create some problems in the genome, then it becomes risky for um, you know, giving it in the, directly in, uh, for uh, in vivo editing. Right. So therefore, you need a very precise, precise editing system, which need to be validated thoroughly before uh, considering them for direct uh, in vivo injections. The other way of doing is uh, to take out the cells, either make cells of the patients, patient specific cells. In case of sickle cell, people aspirate the bone marrow, purify the CD34 positive stem cell precursors and do the editing in them. So in our case, we make IPS cells from patients who carry mutations, and then uh, we edit the stem cells. And these stem cells can then be thoroughly evaluated for desired edits and absence of off-target edits. In case of base editing, any bystander edit, if it is there, these can be thoroughly sequenced, confirmed. And then the stem cells can be converted into retinal cells and can be directly injected into the eye. So uh, in our lab, we are exploring this approach of using stem cells and editing the mutation in stem cells and then up, um, uh, looking at the possibility of using the edited stem cells uh, for therapeutics. So this is what we call it as somatic cell editing, that is in vivo injections, where you combine gene therapy along with CRISPR editing system. So wherein you pack your CRISPRs into the gene, um, gene delivery vector, and then directly inject into the eye. So this is allowed somatic cell editing because it is uh, somatic cells. So if there is editing that is in, uh, uh, affected in a patient, in a tissue, in a bone marrow or in the eye, uh, so it's not going to be transmitted to the next generation, right? So it's going to be contained within the individual. So this is allowed. And there are many uh, trials that are already ongoing and somatic cell therapy uh, trials for various diseases are already uh, ongoing at different stages of evaluations. So here is an example that I've uh, given you for uh, AV2 uh, mediated base editing system to correct the mutation in the same gene. So earlier in gene therapy, uh, people use RP65 gene itself packed into the virus and delivered. Here we are packing the base editor and delivering into the cell and allowing, asking the base editor to convert the mutant base. 
Okay, so here the mutant base is uh, it, it is a C T. So the the codon uh, C G A is converted to T G A. T G A is a stop codon. So therefore, the gene, um, the protein, full length protein is not produced. A truncated protein is produced and becomes non-functional in the patient. And the base editor converts the T into C. So CGA conversion is made possible. You can see that uh, in, in un unedited cells, you have barely any protein um, being expressed. So after the AV vector has been uh, delivered, to deliver the AB uh, base editor, so you have a restoration of protein production after uh, treatment. Similarly, in this case, in case of uh, RD12 mice, here is the coneristin uh, expression. So you can see that uh, the, uh, the protein is bare in untreated cells, there's barely any protein expression. After treatment, you can see that there is restoration of protein expression and normal retinal architecture being restored. So there's also another uh, trial uh, that's already uh, going uh, for the treatment of uh, the condition called LCA10. Um, uh, for for the gene called uh, SEP290. So this uh, gene carries a mutation, not even in the coding region, but in the intronic region, okay? So this intronic uh, mutation, what it does is, uh, so it prevents the normal exon. We know that RNA, when the mature RNA is, is formed, you have a coding region and non-coding region non-coding region have to be spliced and removed. So because of this mutation, this splicing doesn't happen normally in this case, and the exon 26 to 27 splicing doesn't happen, and that is affected because of a mutation in a non-coding region. So what they have decided, uh, they have done this uh, here is, they have designed two CRISPRs to flank this mutations and create NICs here and chop and remove this mutated basis, uh, mut uh, um, uh, mutated region. So that that uh, the normal uh, uh, splicing of exon 26 to 27 is restored. So here uh, they have used then uh, they are not uh, doing any base editing mechanisms, but they have used simple NHAGA repair mechanisms. Whereas you are just cutting and removing this particular base, thereby removing the problematic mutation and restoring the normal gene function. Okay, so this has shown promise in um, uh, animal studies and they have went ahead and done uh, clinical uh, phase one to study in, uh, in, in a trial called Brilliance trial. And I, I think out of 12 patients, uh, there are 14 patients were recruited and uh, only uh, two uh, who had homozygous mutation had shown some promising effect in uh, this case. So I'll give you one example of base editing uh, uh, in our case, our own example. So uh, here uh, we are again uh, looking for editing the gene RP65 uh, in a patient. You can see the normal sequence of a patient that TGG is a normal sequence. And this is mutated to TAG. So this is TAG is a stop codon, we all know that. And therefore a, pre a truncated protein will be produced in this case. So what we are trying to do is use an adenine base editor and convert the adenine to guanine back to normal condition. So that's what we are aiming to do. And we have designed a guide to target this region. So the desired base is at the position eight, eight from the distal end, eight base pair from the distal end of the guide. Underline, guide region is underlined here. So we are trying to edit and correct this base, but there are other areas in the near vicinity. This is what I was talking about, bystander effect, right? So if any of the other A's in the near vicinity within the guide target region gets edited, then you have problems. So you can create other uh, mutations also, right? So when we analyze, so we have done this in an ex vivo setup wherein you have uh, patient-specific stem cells, and you introduce the base editor into the stem cells and you expect, you screen the stem cells which are edited for the desired conversion wave uh, has happened or not. So here is the analysis uh, results. You can see that uh, 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 we could achieve about 62% conversion, right conversion at the target size, A8 position is converted 62% of the cells got correctly edited. 
And out of the 62% uh, uh, edit efficiency, none of the edit has happened in any other uh, bystander effect. So you have A8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 A's have been looked at. None of the sequence um, got edited uh, at the uh, bystander effect. So you have precise target specific edit could be achieved in 62% of the cells. Okay, so. But there are uh, groups that have shown similar studies and shown that even if you could achieve 10 to 15 or somewhere in the range of uh, 10 to 20% edit efficiency, you could uh, produce some physiologically uh, uh, effective um, uh, uh, levels of protein expression being restored, and that can restore uh, the function of the cell. So, and we could, from the edited pool, we could also screen for uh, colonies, clones of cells, uh, which are just uh, exactly edited, so that they will have 100%. Every uh, cell in the clone carries only the edited cells. So this is possible in the stem H vivo editing mechanisms. Whereas when you're directly injecting into the eye or any tissue or into bone marrow, the edit efficiency matters. So at least, but uh, so the consensus is that about if you, even if you could achieve about 10 to 20 percent efficiency, uh, it's possible depending on the genetic um, uh, mutations that are involved to achieve um, uh, physiological uh, restoration of physiological functions. So here is a sequence analysis that I've shown you. This is uh, uh, in the, uh, this is in uh, the patient line where you have the mutation TAG. And you can see that in a pure clone where every cell is edited, uh, uh, carries the right edit, you see that uh, you can see the con complete uh, conversion of uh, TAG to TGG. It's not a pool analysis. So you have some cells that are edited, some cells that are unedited. If you have a clone uh, uh, cells being picked up and expanded, and you can show uh, have a complete restoration of uh, uh, corrected uh, gene mutations. Similar thing has been done for sickle cell disease as well. Uh, sickle cells, um, uh, you have a mutation in the globin gene, and, uh, wherein uh, GTG uh, is, is the, uh, is the is T, the, the, in the GTG codon, the T is the mutant base, and this is converted to A. Uh, so the GTG to GAG conversion will restore the sickle cell disease. So how uh, they do, there are, tri there are many trials that are already ongoing where either the CRISPRs are directly injected into the bone marrow or the CD34 positive cells. Bone marrow is aspirated out of the patient and you purify the CD34 positive cells and edit them by introduce the CRISPR into the purified population outside in the dish and then give it back. The edited cells are then injected back into the patients. So that is how it is done. Um, base editing of CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells were shown to rescue sickle cell disease in mice. Again, edit efficiency have varied depending on many studies have come up. Uh, from about 10% to anywhere between 40% edit efficiency could be achieved. And uh, this can help uh, to bring about a disease reversal. So, but there are a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, though there are many therapeutic possibilities or uh, challenges uh, that need to be uh, kept in mind while devising any strategies uh, for therapeutic applications. So we know that um, uh, CRISPR works based on precise targeting. So first information that we need to know is what gene is affected, for which we need to have a genetic screening of the patients and identify the exact mutations and, and disease reverse, and particularly if it's a single gene disorder, the single mutation causing the disease, so if you can correct the mutation, then the disease reversal should be made effective. So therefore it is feasible only for single gene disorders and in case of recessive diseases, in the case that there are two copies are affected that gay resulted in a disease. But even if I can effect correction in one of the alleles, then that should be able to reverse the disease phenotype. So in those cases, single gene disorders and recessive diseases are something that 
many groups are now targeting uh, to edit and correct for uh, disease reversal. And causal limitation should be known and identified because only if it is identified, we can design guides for that target region. Okay, so if the mutation is not known, then it's not possible to devise a CRISPR therapy for such conditions. And it requires high fidelity editing system. As I told you, you need um, with CRISPR, normal CRISPRs, we have off target effect problems because it can go bind elsewhere in the genome and cause a lot of genomic alterations. And in case of base editors, we don't want any bystander effect. Exactly the base that we want to be corrected need to be corrected, not the other A's or other G's in the near vicinity. This is something that we need to worry about while designing the guides and uh, devising the system before planning for any translational applications. And we also need high and efficient delivery systems. As I told you, whether you're doing it in this, in stem cells, or if you're directly injecting in the tissues, you need a better mechanism of delivering the CRISPRs into the cells. So only if the CRISPRs enter the cell and enter into the nucleus, it can do the job. So yeah, delivery mechanisms is another thing. Now, widely people are using viral vectors. We know that from the gene therapy history, we know that it's going to be very costly and expensive. So people are now looking at developing cost-effective methods of delivery systems, non-viral delivery systems like nanoparticles, lipid nanoparticles, and other um, mechanisms of deliveries now uh, under uh, evaluations. And in vivo editing also requires surviving cells. So if you're targeting editing directly into the tissue, if it's a degenerative condition, so the cells are already dead, then even if we know the mutations, it's very difficult because the cells are already gone. And therefore we really cannot if you think about gene therapy or gene editing therapy in those cases. So therefore, Clear selection of patients uh, is very crucial. Patients who have still surviving cells are the ones who can be considered for treatment. So not all patients will benefit, right? And it requires strategies to prevent adverse immunological reactions, particularly if viral-based delivery systems are planned. So in the viral, because you need huge amount of virus in the range of 10 power 4 viral particles, uh, 14, 10 power 12 to 10 power 14 is the number of viral particles that are injected into the uh, tissue. And uh, that can uh, cause some immunological reactions. So all of this have to be taken into account while uh, devising uh, these therapies. So uh, and another important aspect is there are many developmental anomalies, uh, like uh, children are born blind or the, the, uh, the organ is not formed properly, or the, say, for example, uh, congenital cataract in the case, uh, the, the lens is totally ab ab abnormal or it's not even formed. There's no cornea being formed, retina is totally underdeveloped. So in those cases, because the tissue itself is underdeveloped, you really can't do anything about those, uh, those patients because uh, whatever interventions has to happen, happen during development itself when the tissue is being formed. So if intervention is not done at that stage and the tissue is not normally formed, we really can't revert the whole process. So in those conditions, which are developmental anomalies, it's very difficult to intervene. In that case, it has to be intervened at the embryonic stage, but embryonic editing or uh, uh, correction is, uh, at this moment, it's not possible um, because it's totally restricted. It's, uh, uh, it's prohibited uh, by law. But however, this can be done in uh, animals for creating animal models. We can inject CRISPRs into the developing embryo to create developmental anomalies to study uh, uh, developmental diseases in animal models that's feasible and allowed, but not in humans. So therefore, these are some of the limitations that we see. This is not a panacea, but then this is a definitely a possibility for treating many uh, single gene disorders and recessive diseases, provided uh, we have cost-effective delivery systems and effective uh, ed editing systems uh, developed and, uh, and validated thoroughly uh, before we uh, propose for their application in clinical uh, for clinical use. So with that, I will stop and I will take any uh, questions from the audience.
questions for the program? Questions? Questions? So let us uh, move to the other uh, session on the aspect of the And the third session is going to be our uh, very strong session. Uh, in this moment, we can agree with the Yes. So before that, let me introduce Dr. Priya. She is not the as she has been delivering here. Uh, here the lecture on the number of rights in 2019, yeah, yeah, 2018. In the moment, you can and stop sharing. Uh, you know, we can take the question last. She is associate professor in the Cancer Institute, Chennai. She has been working on the field of cancer, uh, you know, the theme of hospital 15 years, and she has the opportunity to develop the first healthcare research vaccine therapy program in the country. For clinical cancer patient and test the same uh, in the case of life. The same is now being extended to the phase two. She is currently working in the same line of the genetics and vaccine program using recombinant SPA, AD 94, SPA 940, which was discovered as a tumor associated for the time. Uh, it's published in a number of papers related to the cancer therapy, injections and genetics and vaccine in particular as well. As well as immune suppression in cancer, exploring the immunotherapy option for other cancers uh, in spite of artificial illness. Thank you. One moment, okay. One moment. Here, sorry, I don't Okay, ma'am. Okay. Oh, 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 okay. Very good evening to all of you here. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on a Sunday, on a day in the day. Uh, that there are so many enthusiasts who are willing to come and attend the lectures, both offline and online, it really gives us a lot of motivation. And thanks to the TNSF team and uh, the DSL uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity again. Uh, it's really feeling like a uh, homecoming again. And uh, what really uh, motivated me to create a civilian's invitation, despite not being an expert in thinking and it's the fact that uh, Dr. Ben was speaking before me and that uh, she was going to touch upon the and I'm uh, very much familiar with the work that she's done in the community in any of her. And uh, this was really an amazing uh, evening listening to her. Uh, but uh, you know, as I said, I'm not an expert on leukemia. Despite having worked with cancer, what I primarily worked on is solid tumor, 
basically cervical cancer. I am moving on to other solutions. So this is unfamiliar territory to me. So uh, you know, in case there are some shortcomings in this please do email me your questions, and if I'm not able to answer them, I will get back to you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I've done here is uh, when I realized I had to give this lecture, I went through what I what I knew about leukemia already, and I knew very little about it. And I had to do some very basic uh, research on it, uh, where it starts and then how it all uh, goes wrong. So uh, that is why uh, my lecture is going to be, again, very basic. It is going to start with how the blood cells are formed. This is going to be a very simplistic explanation. Those of you who are not from a biology background, I'm sure this will uh, be helpful. And for those of you who are not, who are from the biological biology background, this is going to be very simplistic, too rudimentary. Uh, we will move on to something more uh, interesting to you, or uh, more, something that is more interesting in terms of the uh, mutations associated. And finally, I will talk about the current therapy that is available. I am not going to touch upon the late therapy therapy because uh, we have spoken about it uh, at large. And I will focus on the therapy that is the chemotherapy and other existing modalities. Uh, very briefly, to give you an idea of what the patients will undergo when they come to treatment uh, for leukemia. So that will itself give you an idea of how uh, the current modality, modalities of treatment are you know, short, and that is where we take off the beta uh, energy cellular therapy. So that starts off from where uh, you know my lecture is. So sequentially, if you see, I should have uh, given you a primer and then uh, Dr. Ingus talked about uh, giving you a lot more uh, clarity. But uh, since she's spoke first and she's already given you uh, an understanding of how beta energy works, I am just hoping to give you a primer on what leukemia is and how it develops. So, uh, in that. So, um, we are going to look at the process of blood cell production. Very briefly, this process is called as hematogenesis. Hemat, anything related to hema, hemat, you know, is actually uh, referring to the blood. So, the process of continuously making blood cells is referred to as hematopoiesis. Now, in this process, the whole uh, cell continuously replaces the blood. And then it starts at birth and continues throughout the life of the organ. So, where does it all happen? I, I think the audience here might have a little bit of difficulty, but you can see that uh, yeah, the spongy tissue in the middle of the uh, bone is actually a form, uh, uh, but it, it does have this spongy network, and you have the blood vessels running through it. It is here that actually you have the red marrow and the uh, blood stem cells or the blood forming cells. Uh, these are actually going to be produced in this uh, area. Okay. So, so uh, how does it happen? So, we have what are called as a common originator cell. This is called as a hematopoietic stem cell. I'm sure most of you are familiar, even if you're not a biogen biologist, what is this term called? Hematopoietic stem cell or HIV, which can develop into different types of blood cells. So you have a common originating cell, which then differentiates into different uh, cell types of the blood. So you have the hematopoietic stem cell, which has a few genes turned on and off. So this genetic switching happens within the marrow. And as this uh, the switching progresses, you have the cell uh, developing into the next precursor cell. So this is where I use the term precursor because uh, it is still not committed to form a particular cell type. So uh, it forms what is called a multipotent multi stem cell. And then this may either go towards a more lymphoid or a myeloid region. So these are the different types of cells or the area region for that matter. So uh, we have heard of the blood cell department. We know that way. So as this happens, you have either cells going towards forming your white blood cells, your red blood cells, or uh, your platelets. 
I'm sorry, but it's okay to switch it off because I'm thinking it's very so if you can see the picture at every point you will need that you you can see that it is called as a multiple cell cell or as a progenitor cell. So when it becomes or when it gets genetically switched on and off towards a particular lineage by either a lymphoid or a minor lineage, you, you call it as a progenitor cell because there's still a few more steps for this particular cell to go because there are more types of WD that the device can do. You can either have the T uh, lymphocytes or the B lymphocytes or the NK cells. So these are the various types of lymphocytes that they form. And again, if you look at the uh, myeloid progenitor compartment, you can do that. What are called as granulocytes, right? You have the eosinophils, the neutrophils, the basophils, uh, and uh, you have what are called uh, the platelets, all coming from the cells which are coming into the myeloid progenitor uh, lineage. So, this, these cells, why I'm insisting that we pay attention to this is because uh, when we come or when we discuss about cancer, we, we, we will look at, uh, you know, defects that can happen at every stage, right? So, um, as uh, you know, I'm saying, you know, quite extensive, but because of because there are multiple defects, at this stage, it is called a blast. So, when we refer to lymphoblastic leukemia, the, the uh, you know, the British word is really negative, but it is not so. The blast is actually a regular cell that is a precursor cell. It's more of an index or something. Right. So, how does this uh, uh, precursor cell? This is actually go to several cell divisions. So that itself will give you the information that these cells are self-regulating. So they can undergo cell division, cell division several times and uh, go towards a particular body. Right. And this takes several steps for a particular cell to become fully mature. So till then, the new Cells are referred to as immature. So, most cases of patients will be Cells will need to travel once the lineage coming time is completed. Once the lymphoblast then becomes a proper lymphocyte with the specific set of genes turned on, if it commits to a B cell type or any other B lymphocyte cell type, it will mature within the bone But if it Yes, reprogrammed or it gets programmed towards the community, then it will travel out of the canal, reach the pipes, and hence the name T lymphocyte, and there it will have a Right? So, uh, most of the cells here, you can see the hematopoietic cell cell, which becomes, uh, which gets committed towards the lymphoid uh, uh, progenitor or the cell, will differentiate or uh, mature into a B cell. Or the team, or anything, all of these will be based on the genetics which is that are turned on or off, right? So, when it becomes uh, committed towards myeloid uh, uh, lineage, you can uh, make the cells of the granular type where you see the nucleus is polymorph, right? So, you have the look piece of the space, and you have even the dendritic cells and the masters, all of which uh, form the granular sites or the myeloid lineage. Uh, the monocytes are not here, unfortunately, in circulation, they are called as monocytes. Once they enter, they will become transplant, right? And all the HSC has the ability to form the erythroid uh, progenitor, which will then become RBC. <laughs> so, when, when uh, erythroid has red blood cells produced, when new horses have white blood cells produced, and later term is called as strong horses. So how long does this take? We know it is a continuous cell renewal process. Red blood cells are being uh, every 120 days. And white blood cells, uh, you know, I was uh, actually surprised because we have talked that they uh, survive for a number of days. But I was surprised to uh, know that some of them survive just a few hours, but some of them go up to a few days. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the aspect of memory, remembering English, becomes very vital to the white blood cells and their survival again is dictated by the pressure that the organism will face in terms of infection. So uh, platelets survive for about five minutes. 
The specific types of hydrolysis, uh, as I have said, uh, before, uh, these are the three types. So, what happens when there's a problem with hydrolysis? So, there will always be cancer for hormone. So, certain conditions, even certain uh, environmental factors, exposures uh, from uh, you know, uh, physical factors, such as radiation, or uh, certain types of medication, can interfere with this hematomorphic uh, process. So uh, we have uh, very commonly encountered the term anemia, where the red blood cells are moving, uh, you know, and this will automatically reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of uh, the individual. So uh, this will lead to a lot of things. And uh, you know, uh, the general fund is immediately common, but it is not great enough, it can be correct, uh, unless there's a genetic anomaly or genetic defect, which is very difficult to add. Uh, but if there are too many plus, can this happen? Yes. So you have uh, erythrocytosis. Uh, sometimes it might and can be reversed, where there are too many plus, too many uh, atoms. Your blood becomes thick, but you don't use it. Right? So uh, in very extreme cases like polycythemia, there are, you have a lot of it can lead to greater stores because of uh, the formation of plus. Right. So that is one of the risks of too many cells being there without actually developing blood cancer. So, uh, again, for platelets, if there are treatments, uh, it's called the wrong side of the year. What happens is that you, know, you don't uh, have clot formation. So, when your clot formation is you just keep bleeding. So, this is the problem. Again, the patient will be transferred with platelets once uh, the infusion is done. Then, Yes, uh, up to a certain number of years, they can uh, uh, <laughs> uh, be and they can survive. So, there are such stock gap issues that are available. So, again, this is uh, a, a problem, a reference problem in patients who have genetic uh, anomalies. And again, chromocytosis is when you have too many patients. When this happens, again, we have a consequence of blood pressure. And uh, in mass forming the cells. And uh, leukopenia, for the, when there are two leukocytes, what happens? If you care of infections, you become simply prone to too many infections and uh, uh, the general bleeding of the disease. And if there are too many white uh, cells, it causes uh, uh, leukocyte infection. Again, it may be due to an infection wherever your body is fighting by the way. White blood cells or the leukocytes. Uh, However, when there's a persistent high white blood cell number without uh, you know, um, a referring infection or a plausible reason, then, there's, then the physician will start to look at the possibility of a uh, disorder like this. So, as you know, cancer is. Just an uncontrolled proliferation of the normal cells. They have uh, undergone certain uh, changes to uh, you know, kind of uh, make themselves special compared to the cells, their neighbors, cellular neighbors, which allows them to keep dividing uncontrollably, thereby causing cancer. So, uh, this definition can also be extrapolated to your uh, blood cancer type. So one of the types that are known to us is leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma. So all these three uh, different types of blood cancers arise due to their errors in uh, genetic information of the blood cell. Um, again, as you can, you have uh, uh, you are familiar with the types of risks associated with, uh, say, for example, <laughs> Similarly, there are other studies, non hereditary uh, factors, which can cause uh, these types of things. We will be looking at these as well as a uh, small uh, risk of inheriting these things. And the consequence of this, what happens, uh, you know, if you can recall the stage of the development when you have low genetic effects, which are not fully controlled. Uh, the genetic mutations will start accumulating. So these cells, if you recall, are not fully mature. They are still immature cells. And as a result of this, they uh, these mutations, they stop 
Uh, and sometimes they are associated with freedom of class. Unfortunately, sometimes they are associated with poor outcomes. So uh, here, this is the molecular genetic makeup of arthrogenic plastic. You can see here the pentapoidic uh, uh, stem cell. Uh, here we have taken the example where we put the point for the cell. So we then going to get genetic predisposition, and I said it's all over. The inheritance matter is very small, very few, very small uh, percentage of these leukemias are actually inherited. Yes, the leukemia is a predisposition. Or if there is going to be an initiation event to some other exposure, there is going to be a drive in mutation. Here, uh, it, there is an ED6 uh, uh, RAMX uh, 1 uh, mutation that is given here. This is one of the three uh, three areas. Uh, uh, Lineage. And uh, uh, here uh, the, the IK where F1 and uh, the EDPs do need to your DLs. So such genetic uh, alterations that happen can uh, you know push a cell with a progenitor cell called, uh, or or a free B cell. So these are all the immature stages of the cell development. Here we have dealt with B cell we dealt with B cell more uh, um, uh, commonly, because as we saw in the previous image, uh, the majority of these leukemias actually were being uh, So uh, there is a lesion that is generated, uh, leading with aberrant activity in the uh, recombinant, uh, recombinant activity gene, which is very essential within the B cell to allow it to function as a proper antibody producing cell. So these uh, B cells are what the you know, sentinels of the tumor. So they are the antibody producing cells within the body. And because of such defects, there is no formation. There is an error uh, at the pro or the pre B cell state. Not the pre the cell itself to go into mature uh, these people. So then there are a series of cooperative events, again, in the form of genetic alteration or alteration, which will allow these cells to undergo proliferation. But without coming towards the radiation. So you have the other uh, 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 you know, cell accumulation because of excessive cell proliferation. And it is at this stage that the patient gets actually diagnosed. And uh, here is when they actually undergo treatment. But again, chemotherapy is not a solution with a, a, a treatment which can cure all the cells. So it may impose what is called as a selective pressure, whereby we target those cells which are dividing very rapidly, but leaving those cells which are actually uh, if it's slow in their selection process, thereby uh, putting an artificial selection pressure, eliminating all fast uh, growing cells and allowing the slow growing cells to catch it and again for them. So, this is called as a relapse. So, again, the brain of cancer is where a patient actually is. You know, uh, never sure if the disease will uh, disease has completely been cured or if it may come back. So this, you know, lack of surety, lack of certainty that the, uh, they are completely clear disease is always going to be, uh, uh, you know, a problem with chemotherapy and the existing therapeutic modalities. So uh, as I said, it's all in the genes. So this is the part where we discuss or we kind of pay attention to the genes that may actually uh, cause some of these uh, uh, effects, thereby leading to injuries. So uh, as you can see here, most of these may be, uh, you know, transcription factors, which are basically proteins which carry the message from uh, outside to uh, the DNA directly. So these transcription factors uh, actually play the role of messenger. They directly interact with the DNA and uh, order. So if there is going to be some effect in these transcription factors, they can switch on the process of DNA recognition uh, uh, uncontrollably and not switch it off uh, because of the defect. So these uh, will really lead to uh, you know, uh, the new movement, the leukemia genetic, and uh, can lead to a lot of uh, poor outcomes. So uh, what is actually uh, even more uh, taxing is the fact that two or three of these may can up and uh, lead to a proposal. Uh, for example, here, if we take, take the IP that is one, when this uh, actually combines, uh, or when it is actually found together with the retail area one, 
uh, the radial uh, you know, uh, translation. It has a poor process. Now, what is the beta radial? This is actually a very uh, famous uh, chromosome constellation where chromosome 9 and 20 swap their DNA, giving rise to a kind of primary protein, which is a tyrosine kinase. And this chromosome, this new entity is called the spinner protein. So, the spinner chromosome is something that is uh, present very commonly in the top of my body, but it is also associated with the and when this gene, uh, when this transcription pattern is there, yet combined with this, then the patient's uh, uh, you know, ability to fight the disease becomes very uh, limited, despite there being uh, a treatment option which directly uh, you know, targets this DNA radial transcription, it still will reduce their uh, problems, uh, their chances of survival. And uh, these are all the uh, you know, downstream signaling pathways. Which will allow the cell to commit towards the medical lineage, which they complete, as a result of which they will be committed uh, towards a, you know, a specific lineage and lose their ability to fight the lineage. Right? So, in, this is what this is going in here. In TL, uh, if you're familiar with you know, a modern uh, sequencing technology called the whole link sequencing. Which is replaced more traditional approaches like mice and uh, uh, the traditional fantasy measurement. Now, this group identifies some more or more targets of mutation, like the EP and the next one. So these are prioritized again okay, enzymes which are required for passing the message from outside to within the cell and uh, help the DNA to uh, you know, undergo certain alterations, like the genetic switch to come into the cell for the, the image. So again, this efficient, it, 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 you know, the, the sequencing, the sequencing technology, these platforms also allow us to identify efficient mechanisms, you know, uh, epigenetic, uh, you know, mechanisms where uh, either methylation or some other type of uh, editing or uh, not editing, some kind of chemical signature will alter uh, the gene's expression. So the gene like will switch off or switch on based on the epigenetic. Uh, so, as we said, most of these effects are not inherited, but a very small percentage of these leukemia are inherited. But they are inherited in such a way that the underlying genetic defects not only lead to leukemia, but to various other types of cancer. So, uh, these are associated generally with familial syndrome. Bone and failure syndrome, you know, immunodeficiency syndrome, or uh, suppress the gene syndrome. Now, here, if you look at me, uh, because we, uh, I have also worked on strong changes, I was very surprised because this is a mutation of the gate uh, gene, the TP53 gene. So, this gene is a very important uh, gene coding for the TP53 uh, transcription factor. This transcription factor mutation has, can lead to a number of things, colon and blood uh, related. So you see this as a uh, as an index. A lot of our patients with breast cancer or colorectal cancer or uh, you know, a multiple uh, cancers, when they are tested, we find that first uh, the in case the disease is what they will develop multiple. Uh, in case they have not developed their cat cow, we counsel them and we uh, let them know that they are at the risk. But uh, this, uh, unfortunately, we right now we cannot do more in terms of offering them uh, treatments. Uh, we can make them aware, and uh, this leaving syndrome is one such uh, uh, syndrome. Uh, again, Down syndrome, which uh, is with so only 21, are at a higher risk of developing a natural so uh, this is a portal of DNA patch repetition. Uh, you have the MSH, MLH, all these genes which are associated with ALF. Again, these are we, we must have been uh, associated with syndrome. They are not just lead to ALF. They can only be associated with ALF. There are other issues involved in those sort of things. Hence, such syndrome. Need uh, you know effective uh, genetic counseling and diagnostic tests to uh, identify these mutations are very important. So now we come to the last part where we talk about 
very briefly. Uh, I am now clinician, so I will just touch upon uh, how acute implantic pneumonia is a traditional treatment. Although newer availability and uh, you know, cellular therapeutic uh, elements are uh, emerging, unfortunately, these are still on trial, and the cost of these personal therapies is going to be very, very high. So these uh, have to be developed indigenously for them to become more affordable to uh, the Indian population, to be uh, more accessible to our uh, uh, population. So anything that we borrow from the West, we are not going to be able to afford, and we cannot extend that to the central population. As a result, we have to still rely on uh, these uh, traditional approaches, whereby uh, you know chemotherapy uh, being uh, the standard of care is given, and this chemotherapy is again um, uh, it is done in three phases. The first phase is called as in induction, and most of these drugs, I'm sure. The researchers here, and the uh, students who have uh, into into uh, <coughs> genetics or uh, any other life science uh, course, will recognize that most of these actually are uh, you know, uh, uh, analog or drugs which will interfere with DNA replication. So they will uh, stop either the cell division or uh, you know uh, uh, kill the cell by inducing hydrosis. So uh, most of these uh, uh, drugs are. Uh, chosen because of this potential. And uh, these are uh, uh, given uh, in the first phase. And I am not going into the cycle and because I, I as a non uh, should not be talking about these. So uh, I'm just mentioning the terms here, how they work. Uh, so uh, I was just discussing with uh, Dr. Anderson about, you know, that's how it's good. It is, uh, you know, given as a drug for the uh, Actually, it is levels. So that is one of the good uh, sides of this drug, and this is definitely uh, you know uh, present with the world. It is also used sometimes uh, to curtail the emetic effects uh, that chemotherapy can induce. So uh, this uh, because the ratio is intense. So uh, this is given. usually this combination is given. And this is uh, given in uh, 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 for both the adult thing. Although I can uh, tell that the interest of the data is very much of children, it is also common in adults. And a very uh, similar combination of that, but a uh, very low level is given for children as well. The uh, uh, ugly uh, side of uh, this is that uh, the CNS. That is the central system developed, where the cells enter the uh, you know um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid and can uh, you know go into the circulation and enter the uh, brain. So this can uh, happen, and as a result of this very very intense form of therapy, chemotherapy called as intrathecal chemotherapy is actually administered. So uh, the physician will perform a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture and directly inject the uh, these are the most uh, popular and given as IOC, IA, and uh, then uh, 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 this dietary level. And apart from this, there is CNS involvement, then radiation therapy has to be played and by the court. And I think all of you are aware of the side effects. That such a uh, very taxing regime can have on the patient, uh, especially when we start to the So, the next phase is going to be the consolidation phase again. It is at this phase that, you know, uh, um, the stem cell transplant is advised to allow the patients. So, the patient has finished the induction phase, and they are now going to be consolidation phase, where again, uh, another regime of metaphysic uh, or metaphysic or metaphysic or combination is available. But in case of uh, the availability of matching donor in a regular system, then a central therapy or even an autologous transplant may be advised. And uh, uh, the research has found that uh, at this stage, when uh, patients are uh, transplanted, they have a better Then the uh, you know the main difference is so uh, after the consolidation, after the induction consolidation. Uh, <laughs> Patients that they put on maintenance drugs. So they are allowed to continue, but at different locations, different uh, 
behind different uh, time marks. So, which will be uh, taken by the patient. And uh, the, the patient will be monitored continuously. This process, this entire process of induction and validation and maintenance, will take about two to three weeks. So, two to three years of patient's life is actually important. So, um, you know, uh, as I said before, the uh, blood can it is present in the area which is a more targeted drug for the matter of the particular skill. Again, even uh, despite the uh, you know, presence of this drug, uh, you know, despite all the things, the life or uh, um, or the quality of life patients will be severely affected for about two to three weeks. And worse, uh, you know, uh, never, uh, it, it, it is even more uh, worse when the patient is found to have the disease come by, say, a few years of uh, all the death, and uh, they go for uh, what is called as uh, renal residual disease uh, um, detection, and they are found to have the disease. But at this point, again, the patient has to start a whole uh, lot of uh, you know, uh, lines of treatment. Again, it's going to be cancelled. So, this is the point where uh, you know, new work therapeutic strategy like laser treatment or cellular therapy in the form of what are called as scar T cells or hyperic antigen receptor cells will actually make a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. However, as the doctor even that pointed out in the lecture, was a week that's more to go around. Yeah. And uh, you know, the less said about CAR T, you take more three photo and uh, something not uh, for the bias. Uh, uh, but I'm very happy that you know, uh, institutions like IIT, uh, Mumbai, and uh, actually have started already working on CAR T. So, CAR one is something that has done uh, already uh, taken the lead in bringing it to us. And more such uh, research groups will start on. And hopefully, you know, we will also start working on this sooner now so that we can bring them the cost of the research. Maybe uh, the patient's life will be easier with cellular therapy instead of them putting their life on the board of the research. In such intense patients, only if we buy a good company. So, this is where such novel uh, and emerging technology, and emerging therapy technology. Will play a major role in the treatment. So I think uh, I just I think today's talk because I was asked to talk on the uh, baby. I talk I do speak to that. And Dr. Uh, Andrew has already done a fantastic job talking about how genes can be uh, you know edited. So as I have shown, many of these genes defects can be targeted. And hopefully, you know, uh, uh, the research will uh, make it more focused on uh, choosing those uh, uh, genes or pathways which will not uh, just start with technology, not harm the other uh, normal steps. So that is another huge problem, as she was talking about the bystander report. So uh, there is quite a lot of work to be done, but uh, you know, a lot of results are looking promising. So hopefully, we'll have some very clear results. Thank you. Could it be the that we that by from genetics and part of genetics and part? Yeah, that it could happen more than our issues. And the good thing is, I'm not going to take any of time. And I don't have any slides majority, but I guess like I have to give us the most critical part of the inclusion and confidence. So, Dr. Ingo has already elaborated very clearly on how many engineering can actually serve the sort of these services, like as a therapeutic or gene therapy. And uh, Dr. Priya has very clearly elaborated on the uh, difficulties which the human conditions are faced. The most important one is that in the final slide, she very clearly said, even though chemotherapy and radiation are available, 
do not think it doesn't work for all patients. So what do these patients do? Okay. So this is where the car cases are coming in the winter, which I've already mentioned about that one. So I just briefly tell you so that you understand the concept of gene therapy as well as cancer therapy. Okay. So basically, as she has already elaborated, we have the disease of the red cells. So it is the proliferate you utilize that the red cells remain uncontinuously. So you need chemotherapy again to the build up, but many times it fails. So if it fails, then what happens? So that is why the car T cells are coming in the picture. T cells are basically protecting things, which are control protection against cancer. They are important. We are already having those T cells. But it is just like in some individuals, the T cells are not given up that much to control protection against the cancer. So what we are doing here is you are first identifying the patient who has this disease. You are taking the blood from the patient, purifying the teeth, genetically engineering the teeth. So, why do you need to do the genetic engineering part here? The genetic engineering part here is done in order to enhance the efficacy of the teeth. Okay. Now, once you enhance the efficacy of the teeth, these cells are called as super teeth. Okay. So, some of my students are already getting their letter. So, you know, they listen to it in my lectures. Boring lectures, you know, several times some car cases. So, just to awaken them, just one critical which I always use is Superman, uh, uh, Superman uses car cases. Okay, so the super here means T cells which have been genetically engineered, which have been enhanced. Okay, so these T cells can be introduced back in the body, actually, it's called a cell cell. Okay. So once they are reintroduced back into the kitchen, now they go think out for the retaining for the cancerous and so this is the basic principle of fast cell therapy has been there for almost 10 years now. Several clinical trials have been attempted in New Year. Not how enthusiasm has changed in this particular thing because most difficult forms of leukemia, especially drug resistant leukemia, were cured by this. But what important result of the car cell is that it's called a cytokine storm. What happens soon after the therapy? The T cells are overestimated, are over enthusiastic. We know it will come in enthusiastic, it is good. When somebody is over enthusiastic, one can't be that good, right? So the same thing happens with respect to the immune system. So with over enthusiastic T cells, the process of destroying the cancer cells to clear induced inflammation. That inflammation can actually you not know, target our system, and it can be human muscle pain. Now, this word cytokine storm was very, very restricted. It's something like a magical word because restricted only in immunology, but immunology knew about this one. But this has become more like a common word thanks to what? COVID 19. Because we know in COVID 19, any of the patients who are infected with COVID 19 taken into ICU face the, you know, die miserably. Because they went in for this cytokine storm, and at that stage, the doctor said, Sorry, nothing can be, and now the same thing can happen in the cancer patients who undergo this therapy cells. So, currently, the research is focusing on enhancing the efficacy of these cells at the same time, reducing the cytokine storm so that the patient has more benefit of the treatment rather than the cells. And very recently, Previously, all these therapies were carried out only for recent leukemia. Very recently, a master work was published by a research and traditional genetic engineering procedure. They even made a user locally in the leukemia, in the cancer. That was a very enthusiastic. So, these are all very enthusiastic, you know, mind dropping rocket research going on in the field of cancer. But I think that's never pointed out when the community pointed out. The flip side is the cost. So when you are raising questions regarding this one, as a lay person, you also let us know what you feel when of course all of us are for example, all of us are see what are the applications in our own family, all of us are also on the uh, trauma of attending a cancer patient and literally seeing them die before our own eyes. So if you have a situation like that, and that is an excellent treatment available. But then the treatment is not affordable, right? Four rows to five rows. Nobody can even plan. So, what are the measures that we can take? How much we can represent it to the government? 
Or in other words, what are the alternate tangents we can bring in so that the cost can be reduced and the insulin therapy can be made available even for patients who are experiencing. So, one thing we should all remember is that whether it is car insulin or genetic engineering or whatever it may be, everything is coming out only because of the strengthened trend of the scientists. And as scientists, we work for a society not for individuals. So when we really do this work, the final ultimate goal as the satisfaction is created, we want this one to be translated even to the last member of the society. And unfortunately, it is not happening. So we need to also discuss about this fact that we make sure the robust science, the excellent science, fine dropping science, groundbreaking science, even if the last person this brief conclusion, I will now open up the discussion. So, whatever questions you have come on, the which one will go as well. Yeah, we have some questions in the uh, chat box. First question comes from me. First question comes from me. It's asking, please explain about the expanding now. Tardigrades, exactly how do they go in evaluation? Tardigrades? Is it related? <laughs> so, tardigrades are completely beyond the scope of this study. Okay, but basically, I can tell you like tardigrades are bad and they are the only one they are extreme, they are really to withstand this extreme condition. And recently, lots of enthusiasm are calling for understanding the tardigrade biology because they express the group of proteins which are naturally unstructured proteins. The other group, you know, this that extreme conditions like radiation and things like that, but that is not directly relevant to the topic which we are discussing. Another question, uh, I think something is personal, of course. So, my wife diagnosed nearly near early T cell lymphoblastic leukemia after induction of four MRD negative. Does it require some stem cell transplant? We have stem cell matching six by ten. My father, 60 years old, what is the risk ratio? So, basically, only the ancient can answer that question. And we need to find out whether the cancer is under remission or relapse. And another important thing is we have to understand whether the treatment is over and things like that. Basically, one thing which I can tell you is stem cell separate is in, in cancer is given along with chemotherapy and radiation therapy for regeneration of the cell. It cannot be a standalone therapy. So, questions are from the target. I will hang out. And uh, two questions. Uh, the first question is that the question on uh, the big disorders. Uh, uh, Dr. Priya was mentioning that very few cases of leukemia are hereditary in nature. Uh, that room, in those hereditary cases, the individual is not only affected with leukemia, but affected with other disorders also. In this context, my question is whether hereditary disorders, either hereditary or deeply exposure, the cause of which can be exactly mapped to a single or a report sense, whether it is a challenge. And then my second question is, uh, what is the progressing therapy of hemophilia? Genetic plus uh, blood disorder using gene Yeah, I, I think I take the first question. Yes, uh, we should ideally be traced back to not cells, but at least a single gene or a bunch of gene As I, I have pointed out to you, uh, yeah, the genes which are considered as risk factors that you could identify in uh, the plastic leukemias. So they may be simple, or when they are going to be present along with another mutation or another genetic defect, then the chance of that individual developing a specific type of tumor will increase manifold. Uh, the, uh, you know, the work that has been carried out using the whole genome sequencing technology has uh, you know, uh, done this in terms of identifying 
not just single uh, gene defects, but multiple gene defects, not just gene defects, but the defects in terms of their expression, that there is you know, a very high expression of that particular protein, which is causing uh, downstream so many uh, unwarranted or unwanted defects leading to uh, the development of cancer. So uh, you, we have identified the number of what are called as tumor specific and tumor associated antigens. These antigens are basically proteins, and they arise from the genes uh, which code for them. So ultimately, yes, it does boil down to uh, effects in the gene, in the gene. And knowledge of this, still a lot of uh, you know, effects are unknown. So the knowledge of this, as we do data mining, because no two cancers are alike. You know, even if two people uh, are diagnosed with the same type of cancer, the chances of these being identical, having identical, uh, identical genetic features, be very, very uh, Although, for, uh, you know, most frequent mutations, uh, most frequent defects are known. If you look at the ECTA uh, database, the percentage of patients, they are about 100. The percentage of patients who carry that most frequent uh, genetic defect would be 10 percent, 15 percent. What about the rest? So it's either a combination of all these defects or uh, you know some unknown uh, mutations or genetic pressures are still existing, and there's still a lot of work to be done. Hopefully, you know, we are, the whole world is now uh, coming uh, closer with all these technologies coming uh, or being becoming accessible to countries like uh, India. So we are able to keep uh, pace with uh, whatever is happening with us, but still, cost is a very huge even in terms of diagnosing these genetic features. You know, uh, I think uh, the lower income uh, population is absolutely not able to get these tests done. So, yeah, a lot of work has been done with regards to legalizing both the uh, testing diagnosis as well as the questions. Maybe I will take the hemophilia question. What is the protein regarding hemophilia? Because my understanding is it is very uh, simplistic. This what they say one to one correspondence when uh, the genes have been already identified. Uh -huh. So what is the progress in that? Okay, it's in the moment. Okay, hemophilia basically caused with a mutation in the X chromosome. So since men have only one X chromosome, whenever they mutate the thing, obviously I kind of told it's something that much in the ego. Now, coming to the treatment, apart from being a genetic disorder, no treatment is directly available for them. But the interesting thing is that, again, in the therapy, as I've already pointed out, come, 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 combined with uh, stem cell therapy is offering new hopes in that world. So, here, what to do? The patient is diagnosed with hemophilia, you take the bone marrow stem cell, genetically engineer so that the defective gene is corrected, and then the genetically engineered stem cells are reintroduced back into the patient. So what happens? These stem cells is again go into the bone marrow. They will launch them, differentiate, and start producing a new background of blood cells, which do not carry this effect. So that's the way I think you can treat hemophilia. But genetically engineered stem cells you can get to the other. So right now the strategy is still at the experimental stage. It really hasn't gone up to the next stage. In cost, in cost. The, the cost factor, yeah, so even to conduct experiments on hemophilia is a very, very difficult thing because we do not have very reliable animal models for hemophilia. But once it is made available to the bedside, it is going to be extremely costly. So we really need to, you know, very, have a very brainstorm to take care with all the concerns, all the associations and things like that, to think in how we will be able to bring down the cost. Problem with this state growth, huh? What is it? Yes, yes, the problem is yes. Even for yesterday, I'm sure they all of you don't even hear about a small world for diagnosis and training from EO. And there was no money for a treatment and public funding for carrying it. And finally, the government came back and stepped in. And the finance minister said they will pay off the 80 percent tax. And that's how the treatment was given to that group. So that is the kind of cost associated with treating the genetic disorder. So under percent, we have hormone sensors. We can capture this word. The cost cannot come to
So, how can we treat by the cancer cells? So, yeah, the cancer is not mutated because the cancer cells are not affected. So, what we are trying to say here is you are not directly targeting the cancer cells and trying to reduce the need to take the cancer cells. Rather, what you are doing is you are taking the immune cells to the patient. So, this is what has been technology. You are enhancing the ability of the immune cells and reintroducing those immune cells into the patient. Because these are normal immune cells, now they are going to get the temperature to work faster. They will go seek out the cancer cells and destroy them. Got it? Yes, sir. Got it. Sir, in the cases, CD34 and intemporetic prognitor, can we look at what that? No, here we cannot use CD34 because CD34 they will be CD8 and all those things are markers for stem cells. So here we are not targeting the cells, we are targeting only the mature people. So the markers which will be looking at for in CD34 and CD34. I have one more question with the leukemia. Currently, it's a difference last population in patients in painful glass and the bone marrow glass. So why is that? And depends upon the glass, whether the security is the more or less. Yes, the marrow glass, the animal rescue disease that I was talking about, the animal rescue disease that I was talking about, is routinely done as a follow-up for patients who completed the test. So they routinely monitor the circulation glass using specific protein markers to see if they are present in the medical circulation. So unfortunately, if they are going to present the marrow, and maybe the number of glass or the period of the glass will be less, they will not spill out into the circulation. So that is why uh, minimal residual disease, but it is still considered safer for these patients uh, and they are not moved as relaxed if the percentage is going to be minimal. Right? Uh, it is not going to again uh, catch up to a number of patients. So uh, based on several studies that have conducted in the past one of my uh, Seniors in the lab who, who was working with the TAL. So he tried to uh, set up a method whereby we monitor the number of cells. And we actually come uh, to a cutoff point where we know that if the percentage is still there, say 1%, 1%, but still the patient is not showing clinically the symptoms of the disease. So uh, we tried using several methods. And now a uh, technique called pro segment is routinely used. For monitoring uh, the MRT levels of the patient. And uh, the uh, set protocols are available. So the cutoffs and just like how you have your uh, you know, blood test and you have uh, on the side the range that is normal. So the MRT also has uh, been researched by the and these ranges are set out. And based on these uh, last percentages, the data of the test, the British will decide whether you need to go to the other people or you will be Thank you. 
how can the enemy put say the new exchanging DNA is only the other one dying of type of cancers? How does it going to be extremely reliable towards the DNA? But there are chances for us to still get in DNA. Not all the cancer types which are the DNA type in the place. Yeah, I know. But talking about something called as Yes. Unfortunately, that field is still being uh, you know, under a lot, a lot of research. And I think concrete has so far come as in terms of diagnostics. Because there is still, as you say, it could be uh, coming from uh, you know, your regular blood cells. So, how do you tell it? For uh, germline mutations, where you have these very key uh, mutations, that can be identified. Uh, these have been routinely uh, used for uh, diagnosing and uh, identifying. Uh, too much like uh, breast cancer, familial breast and ovarian cancer. The cure you heard of is actually called Virginia and you will have to work the how you have PSP mutation and she underwent uh, you know, uh, radical uh, surgery uh, because she had a familial disposition. So, such uh, tests for these specific genes, which is very uh, well known and established uh, association with the tumor development. Yes, we offer them genetic counseling and you know such preventive measures can be done, although they are trust. Instead, we can keep monitoring the patient, but the cell-free DNA part that you're talking about shed the I don't think that is getting a diagnosis. So we need a more concrete data to set yes, up more Absolutely, because there is still a lot of background that will come from say uh, a liquid biopsy, so basically your uh, blood drop. Uh, if you're going to use that to catch the uh, DNA that is shed. Or which is coming in the circulation from a distant tumor site, right? So you can still have a lot of battle in my We have uh, regular cells. So, how are you going to tell the tumor? And most of there is, you know, natural break in those DNA, but you identify that wrongly. So, a lot of these have to be uh, you know, standardized and not the The protocols are not different. <laughs> Each cancer type actually kind of getting the insight. Is that right? Or kind of? Yes, it's uh, you know, um, obviously, because cancer is a disease which is more to spread. So uh, now they are looking at the possibility of the DNA for study. And of course, when there is going to be a cancer which is going, going to a certain uh, you know, size, you are not going to have cells that will uh, you know, follow up and you know, enter the circulation. Whether there is going to be uh, some other process whereby cells of the parent do not, uh, you know, are the cells which do not get oxygen, that they, they die, and naturally the DNA from these cancers will enter. So there is a lot of agility. The hypothesis is quite strong that yes, cancer cells do shed the DNA, and if we are lucky enough to detect this, then a lot of early diagnosis is possible. But still, you know, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. In terms of identifying what these genes are, whether these are truly coming from the cancer cell or whether these are actually uh, you know, protein based on DNA coming from somewhere else. So that is something that we need to analyze a lot. Yes, the theory is there, the hypothesis is there, and some groups have shown that yes, this is the case. But in large tumors, yes, the shedding is not more people, but how do you identify small tumors? So one question from the online chat when we look for Dr. Indumati. I don't know like how far this question is relevant to the top, but he can you know it's not relevant, he can also say this one. So just read the question. Uh, please explain about being anything structures or topics metalora, anamlo caries, and pika species, pika species. And one more thing, thyroid fathers have a really vocal cord with it. So I'm not sure that how relevant it is to this topic, but uh, she can just put that on. No, I don't have any idea about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it ma must be a fossil organism, but no, no idea about uh, the editing system there. Uh, Thank you. So, so any other questions related to gene editing? Anybody wanted to know? Yes, we have already calculated. We take the final question.
In fact, she was a manager last year, and today she could clear the plan after the time. She has to say that in Nairobi. Immediately, she asked us to go on into the meeting, don't change the meeting at all. My answer I can available in Zoom. So we set up the meeting in Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for an excellent talk. It was a nice talk. Unfortunately, today is Sunday and Adil is her. And another event is going on in Chennai. That's a book session. We never thought of it now. Book session is a fact. A lot of events will grow there. And that's the reason we got less of a presentation. So even in Sunday, we have a week because we will use the data to data. And my special thanks to Dr. Priya Raman. She's always with us and she's part of the DSA. So many the lectures she has given and we start with that lecture on the cancer in our therapy for Nobel Prize 2018. Thank you, Dr. Aravind. So she actually started our DSA with the DSA and the second lecture participation in the DSA. And he took initiative to arrange this call and discuss with this. Thank you. And my special thanks to the Nikas Industry Authorities to provide the call for us. Another, uh, my thanks to the technicians who are working here to make sure that our audio and video and lighting system are available. And my thanks to all participants, especially this year, to listen to the lecture and to finish it. Thank you very much. My forum is uh, going to have a lot of your such lectures in the future. And we are also providing the feedback form in the chat box. Please um, provide the feedback to the first few groups. Thank you. Also, uh, the participation certificate uh, that we provided to students. Uh, so once uh, you get the feedback form, please correct the Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.